Hello and welcome. We are talking today on the 23rd of May 2019. Difficult day, difficult day for many of us who kind of value Indian democracy and the Indian constitution because you see a second saffron wave across the country. Election results are almost completely in. Trends certainly are. And the leads and the, uh, will probably convert into results as, as the day wears on by about 4.30. But I don't think we can deny what we, the writing on the wall, which is that the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the parliamentary wing of the Rashtra Swayam Sevak Sang, is actually getting 291 seats, which is a good six or seven seats more than it got in 2014, when we all believed it maxed out and that it couldn't get more this time. Uh, we are also seeing the Congress not increasing its tally, the International Congress, to more than 50 seats, if the leads are to be believed. Uh, these all might go up, figures might go up by five or ten, so I think we are not looking at figures here. What we are going to be talking to, and we have a very special guest, Ms. Revti, uh, Revti Lal, journalist, colleague, who has also done a work in a different kind of way in Gujarat than the CJP and I myself have. She's written this book called The Anatomy of Hate. And we'll be looking at this whole question of how this kind of result could have come, how and why it's taking us aback, and what kind of challenge this is going to pose, not just for the political opposition, which is going to be extremely demoralized, but for every dissenting voice, for citizens, for activists, for farmers, for Dalits, for workers, for religious minorities. Because let's not forget the religious minorities are in a state of abject fear today. They have been for the last five years and they've been the first frontline target. So thank you, Devdi, for being here. It's a difficult day for all of us. <coughs> but we have to speak, we have to strategize, and maybe we have to articulate some of our concerns about where we see this government taking us and maybe how resistance can or should be built. So thank you for joining us, first of all. So one of the things, we, Devdi and I have been together for the last one hour just before we started the conversation discussing what we should bring to you. And one, a few things we thought which would be different from, say, the channels, because the channels are getting all the numbers, probably much more expert at it than we are. But I think what we can really look at, what probably they can't, is looking at some of the issues which will be actually very, very uh, focused, sharply, and uh, in our sense, viciously focused on by the ruling party now that it's got unbridled control of not just the Lok Sabha, but probably will also get, get of the Rajya Sabha which is the lower house of parliament and the upper house of parliament. Let's not forget that in the last five years, the money bill route was used by the ruling party to circumvent the Rajya Sabha when it came to important bills like the electoral bonds, political funding, Aadhaar, etc. Now, we have the citizenship bill, we have the NRC, the National Register of Citizens, which we know is taking a brutal, brutal uh, kind of... Uh, uh, people in Assam have really been fractured apart by it. And you have threats made by the BJP president, who is now going to be an elected MP from Gandhinagar, that we are going to bring the NRC in Bengal and the rest of India. So what is this going to mean in terms of a permanent sense of social strife within Indian society, a permanent othering of a certain section of the people, a section of the people that has already been rendered quite voiceless by this election? Revti. I agree with all what you say. Tisa, I want to start straight away by talking about <coughs> Muslims in India across the board and the citizenship amendment bill. Now, uh, if the BJP has the numbers that, it, that, that the lead suggest, then it is likely to very soon get a clear majority in both houses of parliament, which is what is required to pass a bill as contentious as the citizenship amendment bill, which is a bill that gives, that discriminates um, on the basis of religion and sets one set of immigrants apart from another set of immigrants. Uh, what Basically that Amit what Shah said is was that he used the word termites to describe Muslim immigrants coming into Assam, Tripura and other borders, eastern borders from Bangladesh and um, naturalized uh, immigrants for Hindus. Guspet is the word that they use Basically most Basically what we are saying is that the Indian constitution is very very clear on this issue, has always been from the constituent assembly debates right up to today, that the issue of citizenship is not discriminatory. You cannot discriminate on the basis of religion when it comes to uh, citizenship. However, by bringing in this uh, 2016 citizenship bill, the, uh, the, the Parivar, the RSS, the supremacist right, which is now represented in the parliamentary way by the Bharatiya Janata Party, wants to turn this constitution on its head. And let's not forget, which is why I keep saying RSS right up front, 
that though you have this magical duo of Amit Shah and Modi who are winning them the elections, the ideology at work here is that which is there in Kolwalka's books, is there in uh, uh, Munje's diary, which actually looks at a reconstruction of the Indian nation into a majoritarian Hindu state, where there's second class citizens and first class citizens in the model of Hitler and Mussolini. So, uh, if this amendment bill is passed, if you're if you're Hindu, if you're Parsi, if you're Sikh, if you're Buddhist, and Jain, and Jain, Christians are a bit uncertain, a grey area still. You might be all right because as sops, you will be the BJP will treat you as their savior, come across as the savior, get your votes, and say that okay, we are making citizens of you. But if you're Muslim, and that's the bottom line. And let's not forget that in We Are Our Nation Who Define and in Bunch of Thoughts for Golwalkar, Muslims, Christians and Communists are the three enemies of the Hindu nation. So all this is a construct of that and we are looking therefore at very, very difficult times. Uh, I also want to say that we in general, when I say that I mean civil society people, journalists, dissenters like me and you, uh, <clears throat> have tended to sometimes look at the whole of the right wing and the Hindu right as a monolith and in doing that by not looking at the various shades in that spectrum we're also giving them more power to say and do than they have now they have untrammeled power but we still I'd still like to break this up into its slivers Please. a little bit and use the current election as examples of constituencies that I've traveled to extensively so one uh, one of these things is uh, that we think that when the when the Hindu right says that Hindus are natural citizens and Muslims are the others, that everybody is buying this whole thing. But, more, but actually it's a much more complex mix. Uh, even when people say in the 1930s uh, took part in Gandhi's civil disobedience, they weren't actually all civil disobedient. They were actually committing acts of violence in Gandhi's name, as uh, historian Shahid Amin suggested at that time. So if you look at a parallel now, it isn't that everyone has been proselytized or converted to the Hindu right immediately. A critical mass is, we can't quantify that critical mass, but enough for, for me and you maybe, but for me certainly to notice that in Karnataka, in Assam, um, even in places like Manipur where the RSS seems to have started to make an appearance and the one seat that the BJP has now um, won in Kerala on the back of the Shabrimala temple issue, all suggest that there is this monolith of people who say yes we want this to be a hindu nation but actually there is a large unrelegated mass consisting of non jatav dalits uh, non yadav other backward classes who are seen as a traditional vote bank of the bjp many of whom have probably held out we know the micro numbers in a few days but um, what has happened is that many of them say look we don't buy this and many of them uh, you say this is bakwas, this is bullshit, we don't believe this Ram Raja and Ayodhya, the temple thing. But what we've got is we've got some of these schemes and when they say the toilet scheme that you know the schemes that Modi has rolled out in the last six months on which he's put his own personal stamp saying this is my gift to the electorate. Where he succeeded is not just the propaganda, it's also where they feel the, these people feel that they'd be better off with the mainstream than outside of it, more protected, which is why there have been sections of the Muslims in 2014 that voted for him out of fear and some may have voted again, as the numbers may suggest. Um, some who told me that they would, for these reasons, many backward castes uh, and classes and Dalits have also done the same. And there is this feeling amongst them saying, look, the village headman, the Pradhan is telling me that please vote where I'm telling you to. Otherwise, this scheme that is coming, this foot over bridge, or this, uh, this uh, water scheme that's supposed to come to our village won't come. Yeah. So it is so, a pragmatic decision as much as them also saying we have normalized the sense of Hinduness and otherness. So it's not front of the mind, it's now gone to the back of the mind. I'm not saying that's no, necessarily I, I, better, it's worse, but it's also complex. I agree and I grant you that, but I also want to say that uh, uh, we all sort of satisfied ourselves in 2014 uh, when the result also shocked us then. Uh, saying that they've got a 31% national average vote, okay? And I remember saying to many people, fine, but I know Gujarat inside out, and Gujarat has gone up to 52%, Maharashtra was 44%, UP was already 48%. So this critical mass that we talk about, again, needs to be regionally segregated, and then if you look at that, you find a lot of that, it, it, it sort of subsists on 
what has been a legitimization of a very aggressive violence and hatred. I'm not saying everybody of that entire mass, is, like you said, is, is uh, part, party to that, but it's certainly vocal enough to make the others, render the others silent. Yes. And I think that silence of complicity is very, very visible. Yes. And just like you traveled all over, there's another young reporter I know and I respect very much, Part. Part. I know Duali. Part, he's a friend. No, no, but let me just tell you what he's been writing. And he's been writing about agrarian distress, he's been writing about the subaltern class, he's been writing about this thing. And he has said consistently that in the remotest of areas, he has encountered virulent anti-Muslim hatred. So have I. No, no, no. So yes. I'm saying that therefore that cannot be shied away from. No, no, I'm not shying away from that. I'm saying that there is a very strong core that has that. There, is, there are big fat stripes along the core that has normalized it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying we need you to deal saying, with both yeah, absolutely. Uh, in se slightly separate ways Correct. so that we also, when we're, when we're looking at pushing back at this large curve of hate and this massive ball of hate that we're dealing with and the politics of it, then we need to also break it down into its segments in order to be able to look specifically at what is it that is attracting different sets of people to this. Some are saying, I don't have a problem with it. Some are saying, I like it. So the people who are saying I don't have a problem with it, there is there is more hope for making them move. I also found that I, I, I have travelled with and spoken to many cow lynchers, many people who are part of the Love Jihad separating Muslim lovers from Hindu lovers campaign across the country over the last uh, few months and also actually over the last few years because of my book. Um, what I found is that the most hardline of them wanted to engage and talk to people who they clearly see as the other side. As, as political opponents, as people who they can't relate to, but they are open to a conversation. We, on the other hand, have been far less open to engaging with them. So I think as civil society and as people wanting to push back against this kind of politics, we, I think, also need to look at where we have not engaged right. and where we don't have a presence on the ground. In UP, just in UP, the BJP, and I'm not talking about its extended arm of the RSS, its intellectual wing, or the VHP. I'm talking only of the BJP, the core party workers. They've had, they had 40 lakh people working. That's 4 million people yeah. working only in In UP. fact, that is Prashant Jha's book, which he's described very well, that how BJP wins elections, and talks about not the RSS, which we've talked about before, but talks about how under the BJP president and Manin Modi, they've converted the entire thing into a very, very well-oiled, permanent 24-7 electoral machine which is constantly in election mode like you were saying per booth they have 21, 21 people, people per, booth. per booth all the time not just at election time now what these 21 people do it's very important because when we're looking at when we're looking at ground level work this is what needs to this is where there's nothing on the other side so these 21 people are apart from the elections what are they doing they are going into, in their IT team consists of about 10 of these 21 people. They're going into each village and saying, into each constituency and saying, these are the various Prime Minister schemes. Have you, Tista, signed up for it? If you haven't, you're missing out on this electricity or you're missing out on this loan scheme. Mm. So please sign up here. So the IT team is not just going in and doing yeah. propaganda. They're actually making people sign up for these schemes. And by signing up for a scheme, then you're a voter. So, so on the other side, there, are, there is this huge distress and they're saying, okay, the other guy, I don't know who he is, but this person I've met. So there's that as well, which plays a very, very that big role, apart talking, from uh, ideology. In fact, after between the period of the exit polls and the CSDS poll and last year when we were all talking to people and wondering what, where, the way, where we've gone wrong, uh, I was talking to a senior journalist and friend Dilip Mandal and he was saying he had this conversation with Anupriya Patel, who's a you know, yes. uh, minister and a yes. member of parliament in the previous government and she was telling him that she has toured 100 villages in Uttar Pradesh in her constituency, 100. And she said when she toured, toured these 100 villages, she said she was not, didn't find a single village where at least one scheme had not reached. So That's true. It's, it, I, I think it's not experience. so much a question of whether uh, uh, there is joblessness, there's great agrarian distress. Those issues should have been the frontline issues for, the, uh, for both the citizenry and the opposition. But by converting it to the fact that at least I need another five years to deliver, the other side has got 30, 40 years, that sort of discourse seems to have worked. I think another issue which is quite worrisome if you look at the results, and we need to be talking about the worrying situation as much as the, uh, where, the, uh, where the opposition and all of us might have gone wrong, is the fact that 
people like Anand Kumar Hegde, you yourself are saying. Yes. People like Sanjeev Balyan. Yes. Might actually make it. We are not sure Pragya Thakur yet, but even she might. She's leading by very large. No, margin. but I'm saying. Let's yeah. assume that you yeah. know these three symbols of a kind of politics, Extreme a kind of language, a kind of hate politics, hate language. What does that mean for Indian Parliament, for Indian politics? And Indian the people, and winning. the Indian people, because yes. I think you see uh, this. Th this question was thrown at me long before you entered Gujarat, two thousand two and two thousand seven. The channels then used to talk to me. Now, when it's sort of blacklisted from the channel, but that then they used to ask me, but how can you explain the fact that Modi is winning? Okay, and I remember answering that you know let's go go back to nineteen eighty four. Let's go back to ninety two, ninety three, Bombay. Yeah. Uh, Bombay then before yeah. Mumbai, and look at those per persons who were identified to be actually leading mobs, whether it was anti-Sikh violence or whether it was uh, uh, the, the post-Babri um, violence. And the, the party of the day, whether it was Congress in Delhi and whether it was uh, Shiv Sena in Maharashtra, chose to give tickets to those persons, fine. We've criticized them. What about the public that voted for them? Exactly. So your politics today is a politics of mobocracy. It's not a constitutional democracy in the sense that every voter is voting for the constitutional values, but is actually voting for a certain, yeah, or, or a caste preference, which is why or a village preference, exactly or a parochial pre preference. Which is what I found when I moved to Gujarat in 2003, the year after the riots for NDTV, and then came back again a decade later to write this book. My impulse was to look at where the hate comes from within individuals rather than look at the leaders at the top. Yeah. And the individuals, I'd say, there is scope for dialogue, but the dialogue has not even been started mm -hmm. at the level of working with people. On the other hand, the WhatsApp machinery and the social media space has been used extensively where in villages in Karnataka like Chikmagalur, the city but also in the rural areas in Karnataka, I found people saying uh, the opposition equals the Tukde Tukde gang by which they meant people breaking up the nation, by which they meant the protests in JNU against um, the hanging of um, the, the man accused of attacking the parliament of Zalguru. Now, until the, until this proselytization has been homogenized and repeatedly sort of sent out in this mass way, received by people who wouldn't even know what Afzal Guru is, who he is, what, what JNU is as an institution, <coughs> have picked up Tukre Tukre. Let's and not forget, I just want to recap for everybody here that <coughs> post-2014, because we need to go back to the last five years, post-2014 when there was a kind of uh, stunned silence in the political opposition of this country, uh, not knowing how to react. That time the Congress party was reduced to 44 seats. Now it's I think probably just going to be 50 or 60 seats if you look at the numbers. We were all saying it might reach 100. I mean, let's admit that. We were all saying it might reach 100. At that time, the first time that the political opposition came out on the streets was on the issue of the land acquisition ordinance, which was, and I'm, I'm going to be coming to that issue because that was sought to be passed by the person who was brought in by violating all the IS norms, was, Mishra into the PMO yeah. and the ordinance was sought to be passed so that the earlier uh, compensation bill which was brought in by UPA 2 was sought to be nullified so that the Gram Sabha, Gram Sabha yeah. permission, the social audit, the proper reparation and compensation all would not be paid when your lands were acquired in mineral rich areas on all those areas. The opposition came together, huge protests in October 2014 and then the ordinance had to lapse. However, all the BJP rule states at the time, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, brought in state laws which countermanded the central law. Now, all this means that through the legal process, through the constitutional process, all this would need, would have need to, needed to be corrected. Now, with this result, it's going to be very, very difficult to correct these anomalies because I am been one of the persons who have been saying that it's not just aggressive Hindutva that this government represents. It also represents an aggressive transfer of public resources to private capital. One of the uh, constituencies in Jharkhand, I was having a conversation with Brinda Karat yesterday, and she said one of the constituencies was entirely run by Adani money. Adani, and let's not forget that the Adani, uh, the stock oh. markets, you know, and they, the money they made in the last yeah. three days alone after the exit polls, when exit polls have been technically banned by the election commission. So if an election is being run, by Adani. There's also the issue, apart from the organization and ideology and the refusal of the other side to engage, which I think is very valid, I'm not trying to run away from it, but there's also the excessive use of corporate money power in the elections, the non-transparency of BJP's political funding, 
which the courts have not yet looked at. They look at it now in June and this aggressive dispensation. We don't know how the court is going to respond. So this kind of money power in elections is also something that you and I need to be concerned about as journalists Absolutely. if we are looking at a fair level playing field. I think what we are, what is sitting under all of this even more than all of this is our institutions which are weak and collapsing and that we can blame it on the government because the government maximizes it and weakens an already weak thing. But what we've got to do is look at the institutions that civil society works with and see where we can strengthen those. For instance, when we're looking at land acquisition, uh, the opposition brought it up at that point when the bill lapsed. But after that, it's not been an election issue. Uh, when we're talking about the citizenship amendment bill, it did not become an election issue. When we're talking about protection to Muslims in states where they've been targeted like Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat, not an election issue for any of the opposition parties. So if they're going to play if they're going to pander to majoritarianism in this way, it's actually majoritarianism that is won even amongst the opposition. And there is where we've got to actually build on <coughs> institutions. So I think the fact that um, there is this homogenization through social media and WhatsApp, we could, we could also be putting stuff out there. We could be correcting fake history. We're actually pointing out fake news, but we're not presenting alternative history. We're not presenting alternative engaging ideas of self which say people with a weak social identity, like many tribal groups, many uh, backward classes and backward castes could use. Uh, we're not doing tangible things. What the BJP has done and also the RSS over time. For instance, in, there was an earthquake in Maharashtra in 1993 in uh, the area of Latur. Um, there was no one to pick up the dead bodies. Oxfam and all these big NGOs went in. Uh, the RSS learned from that. So in, there is institutional learning, but where is the institutional learning on the other side? They learned from that and in the Kutch earthquake in 2001, one year before the Gujarat riots, the RSS Not picked riots, up it was a the genocide, Gujarat, yeah. sorry, the Gujarat genocide. One year before that, the RSS goes and picks up dead bodies in Kutch, which no one else is doing. That led to at least one of the three protagonists of my book, The Anatomy of Hate, to be, to be enamored by the RSS for doing things that no one else was doing. Who is helping people get their Aadhaar cards when it gets stuck? Who is helping people access the the local schemes that they don't even know exist? It is the power monger in so the what area. Basically there is no is alternative power monger. There is no alternative reading writing. So if we started with things like say reading groups with proselytization, not proselytization, but dissemination of alternative but interesting and engaging content through the same WhatsApp, we could actually be making a start. I think we need to start talking about that. It's a good point and I think uh, what we're looking at here is a couple of things that Devdi has said which is that why were some of the harsher issues of the last five years not central to the opposition's political campaign. Mm -hmm. Joblessness was, 24 lakh government jobs was, uh, but I mean things like uh, kind of very false aggressive nationalism were not, lynching was not, citizenship bill was not and when you find that entire secular, uh, secular space shrinking from the political debate, then uh, things are not very clear for the voter. I think that's what that's what you're trying to yes, get at. Yes. And uh, but I think we still can't run away from the fact that an Anand Kumar Hegde is going to win by maybe four lakh votes. Yeah, up to four lakh uh, plus, and he made and statements like women uh, of a menstruating age who who try and go into the Shabri Mala temple should be buried alive. Um, he he's made all kinds of incendiary remarks. Where has the election commission come in and nullified his candidacy? Where has the election come in and struck down Modi's uh, and Amit Shah's election speeches? So our institutions have failed spectacularly. And we, because we're so spread out, we haven't also collectivized the dissent against this establishment. It's so piecemeal. It is so situation-based and geography-based that there's these little, little slices that don't even appear on the horizon. You know, when we come and talk about, uh, say, sections like the religious minorities, Christians are a very small number, Sikh and Buddhist even smaller. Uh, then we look at the Muslims, of course, and if you look at Adivasis, and if you look at the Dalits. Now, it, Dalits are a very interesting section because I think we'll probably get the same figures when we get the figures this time. Because last time, from the majority of the reserve seats, two-thirds of the seats had gone to the BJP. Yes. And uh, the, we saw this, we saw this hugely last time of this appeal that uh, Modi had with uh, this section of the electorate. This time we had something like, uh, you know, 19 lakh or 20 lakh first time voters. And we don't know where that vote will have gone if we get that desegregation. Uh, the point being that uh, I think we're probably going to be look at, looking at the Bahujan Samaj Party picking up maybe 
something like 21, um, you know, now they're saying 11, 11, 12 seats in, in uh, Uttar Pradesh. Maybe it'll go up a bit. Uh, Samajwadi picking up 9 or 10, that's what the figures are showing. Maybe it'll go up a bit. But the point is, they were certainly not expecting to get them to get closer to 40 or 45. Now, Bhujan Samaj Party vote is a very interesting vote because it's a Jata vote. It's a very strong vote that has been committed. Uh, even last time, she got a 20 to 25 percent share, uh, Mayavati ji, when, um, uh, though she got zero seats. Uh, however, we found the standing UP, this something we were seeing and was worrying, and I think you saw it too, that the section of the non jata Dalit yes. is not convinced, is not necessarily being pulled to this uh, circular and, and side. And the reason for that is, is, what I found from the ground is that the non jata Dalit castes, maybe the Valmiks, the, the Beans, Sona, many others, Katik. Katik, the, the Beans, many other castes, uh, what's happened is that they feel that if the, the scheduled caste leaning party is only protecting one large segment, then they are not going to be able to assert themselves. So they'll go with whoever else is being able to offer them some solace. However, there's some caveats here, like say the Nishads or the boatmen of UP. Um, there, is a, there was a Nishad candidate in Gorakhpur in, in, in Eastern UP who decimated the BJP. After having arrived on the scene, it was a two year old party, the Nishad party. And Praveen Nishad contested uh, and won. Then the BJP managed to poach him and take him over to mm. the BJP. But he didn't contest from that seat that he won. He was pushed to another seat called Sant Kabir Nagar, uh, which is a, a, a place with a high Muslim population yeah. named after Kabir, uh, who was a Sufi saint and poet. And its district headquarters called Khalilabad is a, city, is a town that Aurangzeb started. Uh, at, at Amit Shah's electoral rally, the, the, the cultural metaphors are so strong that they had to play kawals mm -hmm. from places like Umra, from movies like Umrao Jan uh, with distorted lyrics to help the BJP campaign, but nevertheless kawals, which is Sufi or Islam, music with an Islamic strain, to then have Amit Shah come in and say Pakistan Kabristan. Mm -hmm. So it's really strange, but that Nishad candidate from the BJP is losing. Why? Because the other Nishad candidate from the Samajwadi party happened to be stronger. So in some cases, mm -hmm. the Samajwadi party and the Bahujan Samaj party have done their bit to try and pull in some of the non-OBC people, some of the non jada Dalits. However, they, their machinery has been very weak for probably various reasons. They haven't had much corporate backing, very little or almost none. Demonetization worked hugely against them and they haven't been able no, to recover and, and, and from and it's a the loss of hard cash. It's also a fact that the ruling party benefited monetarily from demonetization, which is not yes. something that the corporate media talks about. Yes, yes, but I mean, we can talk about yeah. it. So all of these things that have weakened the opposition has put them on a very shaky stool. Then there's also the additional factor that they haven't been able to be brave enough to bring in large issues that would attract uh, yeah. uh, marginal voters like the BJP has. So the BJP's campaign has been more all-encompassing of the Hindu votes. And nationalism and uh, patriotism uh, uh, and the fact that they've created an other and that fear, the cycle of fear and nationalism is a very powerful intoxicating mix which is very hard to break when the institutions of this country are so weak. And I've been weakened over these last five years, deliberately. Yeah, and I think one thing which we have to really be prepared for, apart from this kind of uh, aggressive attack on dissent and all the other stuff that will follow, citizenship bill as Rekhti raised, uh, I think we also have to be really going to be worried about the fact that I don't, this time round, I don't think this dispensation is going to be soft on transferring of public resources to private capital. Whether it is Chhattisgarh, whether it is Jharkhand, the, the only areas which are saved at the moment from being completely rapaciously poached upon, I think there'll be efforts made to kind of completely uh, override any norms, any laws, any environmental laws. We've seen in Bombay, for instance, that complete go by to any environmental norms to uh, and anything else to kind of please a section which was uh, which which they need for other reasons. So I think apart um, that is why I think when some of us use terms like proto-fascist, we the term is because not simply that you have a very aggressive religious majoritarianism, political religious majoritarianism, but also because it's combined with a very far-right position on transferring of private public resources to private capital. The two things have come together under a very strong leader. So yeah. that is all the symptoms of what we call proto-fascism. So it, uh, there are very worrying times for Indian democracy. And I think one of those additional worrying things um, that we've got to look out immediately is Kashmir. 
Yeah. It's the only Muslim majority state in the country uh, which has had, which has been under governor's rule for over a year after the BJP broke its alliance with the BDP party. And the BDP should have been held and, here. And after breaking that, it's overshot the deadline by which the Jammu and Kashmir elections were supposed to have been held. And to rub Kashmiri's faces in this, was e what was even worse is that simultaneous assembly elections or state elections were held in Andhra Pradesh, in Orissa, yeah. in other states, uh, along with the Lok Sabha. Because uh, right they now. were due, they were right due now. in this election, but they were not held in Kashmir, and the reason that they gave didn't seem to convince people that talk. oh, it's security. So if you're going into a booth anyway with that same security, if you can, if you can press on one voting machine, you can press two. Yeah. So to say that it was a so security fact, issue doesn't uh, didn't make sense. Didn't we've wash. Seen since twenty sixteen. There has been a lot of increase in violence, uh, and uh, also local resistance. Most of the ter uh, so-called terror attacks have been. Uh, from local homegrown organizations, not yeah. from across the border, but they've been uh, uh, there's been evidence lacking to connect this. Um, there has been um, uh, withdrawing of security from separatist groups like the Hurriyat. Uh, there has been uh, summary arrests of people who, for which we don't have much detail yeah. on who they are, why they've been arrested. Yeah. All of this is building up into a big, big ball. Election dates for Kashmir have uh, state elections have still not been announced. No, in fact, uh, for a state like Jammu and Kashmir, which has been deeply, deeply fractured, deeply, deeply alienated, uh, we should have had a far more proactive and compassionate uh, process of confidence building in the typical narrative of the state. Uh, and uh, yes, we've seen ever since the Burhan Wani episode of 2016 August, we've seen nothing but sheer callousness displayed by this, uh, the, the, the first uh, Modi government. And now I can't see that changing with the Ajit Dovars and all of them being there. And particularly if you remember the kind of, what you didn't mention was the complete callousness in the bullets, use of the bullets, yes. in the shooting and the way, and the way the army has been forced to behave. I mean, there was there were some standards which used to be set, uh, even with all the allegations of uh, abuse of the army and abuse of the army in the Northeast and Manipur and in Kashmir, we assumed that there would be certain standards which the armed forces were setting for themselves. Uh, though it's never a good idea that armed forces overstay their welcome in civilian areas. But you see all of that getting breached under the uh, Modi dispensation and no space for dialogue, very harsh language uh, and uh, it, it, it really, I mean, our hearts should go out to the people of Kashmir and Jammu and Ladakh and uh, what they are facing today and unfortunately India is so big and so vast and so complex and we are so caught up with our own problems that we are not able to see how difficult a situation Kashmir is in today. And if we want, like emotionally, we are told always that Kashmir is part of India, then we have to feel that Kashmiris should also be part of India. Like after the Pulwama uh, uh, terrible killing of the 44 soldiers, we had this meeting in Bombay. We had this meeting to condemn the attack and we had this Kashmiri student speaking at that meeting. And I remember his words, he said, you know, I love Bombay, I love to stay here, I love Mumbai, I feel Mumbai has been very good to me. But why don't you reach out to Kashmiris? Why do you want only want Kashmir as part of you? What about the Kashmiris? And I think this is something we always forget. And more and more, I think our channels are forgetting this. Our media is, what is it going to be for the media now in five years? We've already seen what the horrors have been in store in the last five years. I, I, I like to say that they've already maxed out in... Uh, by we said over. that about the results, don't worry. Exactly, matter. exactly. So yeah. there's always scope for things getting worse, I think. But I think there is, one can't undermine the fact that there is pushback. It's very small. I think we've got to all re-strategize. We've got to really come up with more robust ways of um, of of getting out our messages and also our interaction with people who we see as uh, politically on the other side, but marginally so. Uh, people who say, "Well, I don't support this view, but I don't exactly object to it either." We are not reaching out to those people, and I think if we did, we could start to at least begin new conversations. We have to start from these new places instead of sitting where we are. That's a very good place, I think, probably to start rounding up and concluding, unless there's something else you want to say. But I think that one of the things we've been concerned very much in Sabrang and with Citizens for Justice and Peace is that when we're looking at the non-negotiables, which has to be hatred and violence, okay? You can have all other differences, but you have to have the non-negotiables which are on the table, which is violence and hatred. And hate, hate speech is not free speech. I've said this again and again, hate speech is not free speech. Because free speech does not give me the right to use a position of power and privilege to demonize an already weakened section, which is what hate speech is. So I think if we can just take a little bit of a 
think back or a pledge or something today that let's do smaller things which we can build into bigger things. Let's think, I mean, this is what I've been saying for the last six months to one year, let's think about trying to teach constitutional values in the classroom, trying to teach young minds what equality and non-discrimination is. Let's have more luck, more luck committees in our uh, towns yes, and villages yes. where we interact with the reading police clubs. and the administration. More no. luck committees where we have reading clubs on Sundays where we talk to people about... Yeah, but I'm interested in also interacting with the police and the administration yes. because today the only section that is heavy on the police and the administration are those that don't believe in the law or the constitution. And I think the police and administration, even with this majoritarian dispensation, needs to know that is a significant section of us who believe in Article 14, Article 21, Article 15, 16, 19, 30, and we believe that the tenets of this constitution are what should run the country and what the police and the administration should believe in. So form a Mualla committee, it's not that difficult. Interact with your local policemen. I think among 10 policemen, you always find three or four who are on your side. That's been my experience. I always find our closest allies are in the administration and police. This country is still founded and on the bedrock of the constitution. We, though it's a very difficult day again for Indian democracy, I don't think we can allow ourselves to forget it. We need to regroup, we need to re-strategize, we need to think of many, many new ways to reach out. But I think option is not to stay silent and the option is to become a little bit more innovative. And maybe like I said in 2014, I said this, not all of you are like full-time crazy people like us who are doing this 24-7, but give two hours a day, give three hours a day, give one hour a day, just to keep sanity alive and hatred away. I'd say I would day. like to use uh, Modi's yoga metaphor and say if he can say that should be a part of your day and pranayama and meditation, then can you think of one everyday thing to mitigate against violence? Something small, like maybe talking to the person who clears the garbage and making her a part of your everyday and seeing where her problems come from and why she may have voted for people you may or may, or may not agree with. Maybe just everyday gestures like that. One everyday gesture. I think that's been an interesting conversation. We need to have more of these. We still don't know what the Bengal numbers are. I think Bengal and UP are still going to be the question marks. Earthquakes. Uh, well, I don't know what I mean. Uh, I don't really didn't know where Bengal is. Bihar has been a shocker. Bihar has been a big, big shocker. Uh, uh, UP still has about, uh, uh, I think, 20, 22 seats to the BSP and SP out of, uh, yeah. which is a reverse yes, from what yes. we have West predicted. Bengal has been a, a huge... Yeah. Orissa, we need to look at. I mean, so I mean, these right. are new areas where you're going to see new forms of aggressive communalism, everyday communalism growing. Uh, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka have grappled and lived with it for, for a long, 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 long time. And there will be different manifestations of this hatred and violence. So we need to be creative in handling it, understand the differences, but also be very clear and united on one point that violence and hatred are non-negotiables. That's all I think I have just now to say, except that it is a very, very difficult and disappointing day. But we need to keep our chin up. And I think need to believe that each one of us, each one of us is a voter, is a citizen. Each one of us above 18 is a voter. And nobody can tell me or tell you that you're not a citizen of this country. I don't think anybody should do that. We have the constitution. We should believe in it. And if, and even your elected representative, I mean, it, it was most astounding and sickening to get, get statements like that you got from Sultanpur and other uh, incumbents saying that if you do not vote for me, then I'm, I will not work for you. I mean, I don't think anybody has a luxury of that, whether it is Delhi or Bombay, even if it's a sweep for the BJP, we must ensure that the elected member representatives work for every section of the people. And I think it's not impossible to do that. But like Rifti said, we have to think out of the box and reach out. I don't think we and can do everyday do small things. And make everyday choices that move away from hate and towards the opposite. Everyday choices, I think. Is there anything else that I've probably no, I not asked you? I think we've we've kind of covered yeah. some ground. So anyway, that was Revti, Revti Lal and me, Tista Settlewa, coming to you on 23rd May 2019. Uh, it's like close to 1 o'clock. And I think the trends are more or less very clearly in. Figures will go up and down a little bit. And there'll be new shockers and less shockers. Uh, I mean, Maharashtra was a big, big, big uh, thing, Gujarat too. Uh, so all of these things we need to kind of let seep in and wonder, look at the numbers, look at the differences. And most importantly, uh, I don't think we can allow the political opposition to get by without listening to what we want them to say. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>